Good morning and welcome to the Sunday worship experience of the Gilfield Baptist Church located in Petersburg, Virginia. We're delighted that you decided to join us today by whatever social media platform that you're using. We thank God for the opportunity to embrace each other virtually and to share the goodness of the Lord with the whole wide world. In preparation for today's message, I invite your attention to the book of Genesis, starting at chapter six, verse one. Now it came about when human beings began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of human beings were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with human beings forever because human beings are flesh. Nevertheless, I'll give him 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came to know the daughters of human beings and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men who were famously infamous. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of human beings was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that the Lord had made human beings on the earth and the Lord's heart was grieved. The Lord said, I will blot out human beings whom I have created from the face of the land and from humans to animals to creeping things and to the birds of the sky for I repent that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. All praise be unto God. Now may the music and the message minister to our hearts.
Shall we pray? Now, God, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The title of today's message, God's Revolution. This passage of scripture, which leads us by way of introduction to Noah. We all are familiar with Noah. He built an ark. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. And he and all of the animals were safe aboard the ark. And the rest of the known world at that time was destroyed. That is how we've come to understand the Bible narrative as it relates to Noah and the wickedness of the whole human planet and God's displeasure. But before that, we get an insight into the various kinds of human beings that God created. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 1, that the sons of God became interested in the attractive daughters of human beings. It's a wonderful way, and if you've memorized it or learned it in the King James Version, the poetics of it are wonderful. But to clarify it for you, it simply means that there were some taller human beings created by God who found very attractive those daughters of average size human beings created by God. So much so that they decided that they wanted to make them their wives and they wanted to have children with them. The Bible says that these giants who the narrator says are superhuman took these mere mortals, smaller stature, took for themselves wives. It suggests quite literally that there wasn't a, an asking, there wasn't a courtship. Those who were bigger and stronger and more powerful took those who were helpless to fight back. They liked what they saw. They exploited their beauty, their reproductive capacity, simply because they could. And what resulted was progeny, children, born to this union of giant and average size, both created by God, but one driven by the ability and the aggressive capacity to take without respecting any other bounds of authority. And the other, not being able to resist or to find any other measure to say no or to resist, had to agree to the arrangement just like that. And so from that union, offspring came. And in that mix of part giant, part average size, children perhaps were born of all different heights and varying degrees of strength. The Bible says here in Genesis 6 that God saw what was happening to the people that God made. Rather than they're taking their lead from the relationship that God wanted to have with human beings, they decided to usurp the dominance that they would have over other human beings, so much so that they became corrupt and greedy, materialistic, aggressive. They took on an air of supremacy and superiority that really only belongs to God, that not even God took full advantage of in God's relationship to human beings. The 120 years, I did some research on that one because I wanted to make sure that I had as much time as the Bible promises. And some Bible scholars offer this suggestion, which sounds a lot more reasonable since I've 
never known anybody to live as long as 120 years. But as God saw just how human beings were behaving toward each other, God seems to say, I'll give you 120 more years to get it right. And then I'm going to do something. God makes a prediction that in 120 years, I will deal with this issue if human beings don't come back to the way I had intended them to be. Sounds more reasonable. Sounds certainly like the experiences that we've had. But God was grieved year after year after year after year. But still, graciously, God gives human beings the opportunity to change their course of action, change their attitude, change their behavior, to come down from their air of superiority, superiority and to interact with each other so that they would balance out and complement each other rather than compete and contend with each other. And after this, God canvases all of humankind in that part of the world. And the Bible says that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the beginning of God's revolution and Noah, who was tapped on the shoulder by God, who was instructed to build a boat that was going to float on water that would descend from the skies to the earth. Now, the Bible suggests that there was never a time that water came from the skies down to the earth. In fact, we're told that that early couple who occupied that wonderful gated community called Eden, that water came out from the ground like a sprinkler system might do today and gave water and hydration to all the vegetation that was around. Yes, Noah begins God's revolution and like any prophet who has to declare what God has given them to declare, never sounds credible to the average ear. Can you imagine Noah building an ark, drawing out every bank account that he ever had, zeroing out his 401k, his iris, even taking the penalty to build this ark, to do what God had instructed him to do and to preach. A day was coming when the wrath of God, the judgment of God would not be held back and only those who would accept God's grace and God's way of life and interaction would be saved. Yeah, it's tr true today that prophets who are given their speeches by God always seem to sound crazy, absurd to those around us. We love to read the prophet Isaiah, but in 40 years of preaching and prophesying, not one person walked the aisle of Pastor Isaiah's church to give their lives to the Lord. He preached for 40 years and nobody viewed in his social media live stream, but he continued. The prophet of God is forced compelled to proclaim what God has given to them because she can't do anything else. He must declare what God has given him. She cannot twist it to make it sound pleasing. No, the prophet of God has to declare exactly the way God gave it to them. What's going to happen? And most of the time in human history always records it that we never listen to the prophet's that God sends to declare if we don't change our ways of behaving toward each other, something bad is going to happen. Nothing good will come 
if we contend for each other and usurp superiority over another of God's creation. The first several verses of Genesis 6 describe a group of people that are also mentioned again in numbers and always pop up throughout the Hebrew Bible. Perhaps even Goliath, that famous son, giant. Perhaps he is the one given the name that we most familiar. Giants, taller than the average human being and somehow designated as being superhuman because they possessed physical strength and stature that made them pretty much unfazed by anybody or anything around them. They could take what they wanted by force and nobody was going to resist. But let's look at that another way. Suppose let's say in an agrarian society, they were able to use their height to find the fruit at the tallest point of the tree and bring it down to those who couldn't get it. Imagine in an agrarian culture, the superhuman beings might be so designated because they would use their physical prowess and strength and stature to do what those who were not as strong and were not as tall could not do. It wouldn't mean that they would have to give up the fruit that they were able to harvest. No, it just meant that they were able to be more effective harvesters and everybody would eat. Suppose it was the case that they used their ability to protect and to secure their borders, not to keep people intimidated and afraid, only to those who meant to do harm to those within that community. They would stand watch, stand guard. So perhaps an invader, an intruder, would think twice before entering that community. No, it says that these superhuman men saw the beauty in these average sized daughters of average sized families and said, I want you. I like the way King James says, and it was a long time before I understood as a child when the Bible says, and they knew them. Of course they recognized them. No, it uh, legal term carnal knowledge. They wanted them, they wanted the pleasure that they were going to provide for them. They wanted the enjoyment at the expense, the bodily physical expense of these young women. And their families were not able to fight against it at all. You see what happens when the stronger take advantage and take for their own self-aggrandizement those who can't say no, those who refuse but cannot resist. We've been talking a lot lately about removing the statues and symbols of the Confederacy and those things which reminds people of my ancestry that in this country, in these borders, uh, that we were the property of other human beings singled out solely on the basis of the color of our skin. Some would say that what happened 400 years ago shouldn't be my responsibility. But what we see taking place in our country and even around the world, even while a pandemic is taking place, is the fact that the generation is sounding the alarm that it is not the rewriting of history or the enslavement of a people that took place 400 years ago, it's to rewrite the history and to reparate the wrongs and to consider the damages 
of the treatment of humankind to humankind that started within these shores 400 years ago. It simply says that throughout human history, there's always been a group of people stronger, that dominates, a weaker, less powerful group of people. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter six, with that kind of behavior, God is not pleased. I know it's a holiday weekend in this nation, but Genesis six depicts God declares a revolution. God says, People have to change the way they use their power. People have to change the way they look at other people. I'm the creator of everyone. If you've got power, I gave it to you. And if you don't have power, I put you in the world to represent and to look like me. I endowed both of you with my spirit. If you can agree, what a wonderful world you will have. You will bring joy to God's heart. But if you usurp the power at the expense of another and you begin to view them as inferior and you see yourself as superior, the Bible says that attitude grieves the heart of God. But what about the progeny, the children born to that union? Aren't they innocent? Yes, they're innocent. But the Bible would suggest that they grow up torn between smaller statue relatives and giants. And they begin to emulate the struggle. And so what happens is the generations that come and go are known more about how they use their power, much like their early ancestors used power, producing the community that they have. It grieves God's heart when people don't recognize the divinity in the humanity, even though we're all different, we look different, we sound different, we're of different heights and hues. And that is to point to the creative artistry of God and never to be used to dominate and to oppress. God declares a revolution. And even in the graciousness, after God makes this revolution known, God's grace is distributed in this way. God says, I'll give humankind 120 years. And then, and perhaps we are seeing the time lapse in human history, in our national history, where signs and symbols and statues are coming down and marches and protests and disruption of the order of supremacy and domination of one human being over another can be no more. And the Bible supports that in Genesis chapter six, that God's heart is grieved by the sin of hatred and strife between the people that God made, all people. God's revolution, but not everybody in the world God had made was trying to dominate, trying to exercise supremacy and superiority. The Bible says God found favor in the eyes of Noah. Noah had to be strong in order to build an ark by himself with the aid of his three sons. He had to be a person of st stature and position in order to halt his usual vocation or profession, whatever he did in order to work on this weekend project, this ark that was going to save humankind from the unheard of rain.
that was going to flood and cover the whole earth, the deluge, expressing God's judgment and God's displeasure with the way people were behaving to one another. God, in God's graciousness, gave 120 years. But Noah, Noah is an example of one of God's patriots who uses his strength and his resources to do what God wanted done and not what he felt he was big and bold and strong enough to do. On this Independence Day celebration weekend, I want to challenge the people of God to lead first by example, black and white. If we claim members of the household of faith in Jesus, that we can never be okay with domination of other beings that God made on the basis of skin color, that we can never say it's not my fault if we somehow get swept into the vortex of greed and domination and not realize that the strength and superiority that one might have in life, in business, in education, in science and technology is not to leave someone behind but to bring everybody along together. Can you imagine what the world would be like if the world sought to live in a way that doesn't break God's heart? Can you imagine the resources that would be available to us and the insight and ingenuity that would open up? And so the word today is that if we fail, make God's heart happy again, then the deluge, and there's always a deluge, God will hit control, ought to lead, and start again. I pray that during this season that we decide to make God's heart joy-filled and lead the world by example as members of the family of Jesus Christ to use our power, our strength to enable everybody, to empower and equip everybody and so fulfilling the example that Jesus Christ made for us. Shall we pray? God, I ask that you lead us all in a spiritual revolution that we will do what brings joy to your heart by taking our strengths and using them to serve. That we won't dominate all of the resources that are available to us and we won't take what doesn't belong to us, but we will use what you've given to us to share and to exalt the divinity that's in everyone. God, I pray that you change the hearts of supremacists in this country and around the world. God, I pray that those who would open their hearts to your divine spirit would seek the grace that you have given, that you would use us use us in this generation and in this time as models whose lives you find favor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My friend, if this worship experience has been a blessing to you, then we invite you to reach out to us, let us know that you've been blessed by this message so that we might in turn be a blessing continually. We invite you to give, to donate to the ministry of the Guildfield Baptist Church. You can give electronically, text us at 732-56 and key in the message, 
GBC GIVE. Until next time. If you Jesus!